Okay, so um, you got two handouts for today, um, exercise 211 and assignment 202. And so in this class, um, it's, it's a little bit hard. A 202 is a tough assignment because it spans a long amount of time because I try to make sure that I give you enough time. And in this particular semester, it's particularly challenging, and I have a note about this later on in the, in the assignment toward the bottom. Um, we have spring break, and it falls right during the week that I would normally have these due. So that means that in my infinite niceness, if that's even a word, uh, I've deferred it until after break, and I'm not making it do the week after break. I'm doing it the week after that. So you don't have to like come back and panic because I didn't cut it and then try to cut it in a day and glue it together by Wednesday. Uh, we just I'm going to give you the whole week. But that means that the turnaround time between 202 and 203 is only about a week. Um, in terms of when they're due. So you're going to end up having two assignments stacked together in their due dates, uh, which I don't like to do, but I figured you'd rather have spring break off than, than and sacrifice having two close together. Fair enough? OK. So um, I'm trying to, trying to make your lives better. I remember when I was a student, and I hated it when people gave me stuff over spring break. So I'm trying to make it a little bit better. Anyway, so for assignment 202, there's a lot of parts to it that end up in a physical model. And so you're going to be building essentially this. The topo is going to be whatever you choose as part of it. And so that's part of what makes it interesting. They're always, they're always different. I won't give you a site and have you build the topo. But I want you to learn the process of making this kind of a hollow, really easy, quick model. You can actually see the, the 220 class in the back use this exact technique to build a model of their site already. Um, this is very cheap in terms of materials. It takes two or three sheets of cardboard to make this, as opposed to the ones where you cut out and stack every one that takes lots and lots of sheets of cardboard. Um, I'll teach you to use the laser cutter as part of this. So all the cutting will be done in the laser cutter. Doesn't take very long to have the cut actually made for you. And then it's a matter of gluing it together. Um, start to finish, if I had to build this model personally, I could probably do it in less than an hour. Um, because I've practiced and, and, and good at it. <laughs> uh, for you guys, it's going to take a little bit longer, um, maybe a day. <laughs> but uh, the idea is that you'll have a lot of time in class to prep a lot of the stuff. So the next three uh, lectures, today, um, next Monday, and next Wednesday, I will walk you through pretty much every single step you need to be able to actually make this. And I'll end with a day where I actually have laser cut pieces and I'll glue it together in front of you so you can see it. I do have a video of me putting it together from two semesters ago. Um, I didn't do it last semester. I thought everybody could just watch the same video, but they seemed to like not get it. So, or, or they didn't watch it. So I'll do it live in front of you so you have to watch me do it. Um, though the video is actually quite funny because somebody gave me a glue container where the lid wasn't screwed on all the way and I, oh, yeah. I explode the, the glue oh, container yeah. while I'm on. Yeah, yeah. get them. So anyway, it's kind of entertaining. This, this semester when I do it, I'll make sure that you don't hand me a bad glue container. <laughs> anyway, um, but this is, it's very cheap in terms of materials to make. Once you have the laser cut file, it's really easy to make these over and over again and glue them together. Um, this, this particular style of modeling is a technique that I used a lot in grad school. You don't have to make it out of cardboard. You can make it out of wood or anything else that you wanted to, though you'd sacrifice the, uh, the ability to laser cut it if it was plywood or something. But it can be a very beautiful model without much material to it, um, which, is, which is nice. Um, you're going to have to build physical models as you go forward in your career. And having this in your back pocket is a really good tool. I've talked to students who have moved on, and they've all said, thank you for making me do this, because I've had to do it many, many times. So just something to be aware of. We, we have a tendency uh, in the studios at DVC to give relatively flat sites. Um, you, can, you can pass that around so people can see it. Um, you know, in your, two, in your 121, you had two basically flat sites. In 220, your first project has a little bit of topo, but you can see the topo in the back. It's not, it's not particularly adventurous. Uh, and then your second project doesn't have much. And then the skyscraper project, if you're in 221, again, doesn't have a whole lot of topo to it. Berkeley, on the other hand, well, at least when I was there, loved giving you cliffs <laughs> to work with. So you were always making these giant pieces of topo. Um, so it was a skill that seemed relevant at the time when I was there. And based on the feedback that I've gotten from people who have moved on, they still feel like this skill is a, a really good skill to have. So I spend a lot of time emphasizing it because I think it's a, an important skill. And I like to introduce it to you before we start working with Topo so you understand why 
I think it's important. So all of that being said, manipulating a two-dimensional uh, or a three-dimensional surface that curves in both directions is one of the biggest challenges in Rhino. And also working with a mesh that you maybe imported from something else and then learning to work with it and turn it into a Rhino object are both skills that are relevant beyond just a piece of topography. But the skills that you learn relating to working with this piece of topography will apply to a lot of stuff. And so I'll, I'll walk you through kind of how that stuff works uh, in the context of this piece of topo that we'll continue working with. So uh, today, we're going to work to kind of get our first iteration of the, sorry, wrong one, of the topo kind of put together. And we could build a topo entirely from scratch. And I've debated giving you a CAD file to work with um, and doing it that way. Though for most design level projects that are not sites as site specific as say, I had a survey done of this site and this is the exact topo, um, we can get by with what's available to us in Google SketchUp slash Earth slash whatever, right? Whatever, the, the Google suite, so to speak. Uh, and so this is the one time where SketchUp might have a leg up on Rhino, and I'll admit to that. Um, and so we will actually have to open SketchUp. So I'm going to go ahead and go and open SketchUp. Hopefully, it'll open a new version of SketchUp, which it looks like it has uh, opened for us, which is nice. Um, all too often, we end up with some old version uh, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't really work. Anyway, so we're in SketchUp Pro 2016. Uh, that's what I've opened. The number of steps that we're going to do is going to be as limited as possible. That's, that's the idea, um, so that we don't have to be too um, adventurous in how this works. And of course, they always move stuff around a little bit, so I have to find where the tools went. The what? Thank you. So it, there used to be a button right here. Not there anymore. So we're going to go to File, Geolocation, Add Location. It, yes, SketchUp's on these computers. Does it not? Does it crash or not? OK, so I went through and I fixed every one of these computers for SketchUp 2015 last semester. So this is the stuff that happens that is annoying. OK, so you know, again, stuff happens. And uh, yeah. so we're not going to do that. However, backup plan, right? I will, I will do my best to fix this before next class so you can actually pick your own piece of topography. But in the world of backup plans, uh, sometimes you have to survive on, on backups. So if we go to today's exercise, which is 2.11, Lo and behold, oh, of course I had didn't log in. <laughs> Hold on. I already have a SketchUp file for you to download. Exercise. Yep, exercise 211. Hold on. It's supposed to be there. Right here. So. Under the third little bullet point, the one that goes over, Hawaii example terrain. OK? So I apologize that you can't pick it, but such is life. We're going to work with this one today. So I'm going to save the link as, and it'll show up as a SketchUp model. I want to save that onto my flash drive under today's folder. So this would be exercise 211. And I'm going to save that Hawaii example terrain. So again, I apologize. I'll figure out whatever the workaround was and why it broke when they updated it. But such is life, right? All right. Yeah, I know. I know. OK, so I have that. Good news is we don't even have to open SketchUp. Sweet. <laughs> anyway, so let's go ahead and uh, open up Rhino here. I have a Rhino file open. My units are already in inches. It is absolutely essential that you make sure your units are in inches before you bring in this file, because otherwise the topo won't be in the right scale. So it is already in inches. And I'm going to go to File, and then Import. 
And hopefully it says all compatible file types. Sometimes somebody in at some point selected a specific file type, in which case you wouldn't see it. But as long as it says all available file types, we can go um, to today's folder. And there it is. Now this is a SketchUp 7 file, so we had to save backwards a bit. My guess is that one of the newer versions would probably work. I just haven't tested to make sure it works. I know version 7 works. Um, so when you do your SketchUp file and you save as, just make sure you go back and save it as an older version. Anyway, so there it is. It's the example terrain. I'm going to say open. And we see that we have the SketchUp import options. And so I have two different options for how I'm bringing in the file. I want to bring it in as a mesh, which means it's triangulated facets of kind of a surface as opposed to a smooth surface. If I do trimmed planes, I'm going to end up with lots of individual little triangles that are going to be hard to work with. So let's leave it as a mesh. Um, I'm joining the import, the edges and the faces. Uh, the weld angle is fine. And we can go ahead and embed the textures. So I'll say OK. And this whole file will come in. And it's obviously, it's a, it's a larger piece of topography there. Um, it did include the little tiny person that came in, wherever that person was. Um, I don't remember. I should have deleted that person before I brought it in there. Oop. There's the little tiny person. The person can go away. That's a, that's a SketchUp holdover. And then let's go ahead and view this not as a wireframe, but as a shaded little piece of terrain. So when we bring it in, SketchUp brings in two things. It brings in a surface, and it brings in the mesh. We can safely delete the surface or turn it off, put it on a layer, make it go away. Um, I'll go ahead and just put it on its own layer, or it may already be on its own layer. Let me take a look. Nope, they're all together. I'm going to create a layer, and we'll call it SketchUp. And I'll create a sublayer for terrain, SK terrain. And these layers or names aren't critical that you match up with, but if you think ahead of time and actually try to create some organization, your life is going to be a lot easier, which is why I try to encourage you to do that. Uh, and we'll call this SK surface. We can always delete these after the fact. That's the good news. So let me take the terrain itself, and I'm going to put it on the SketchUp terrain layer. And let me take the surface, and I'll put it on the SketchUp surface layer. Uh, if I can change object layer, there we go. And then we'll go ahead and turn off the surface because we don't need that. And now we have just this little piece of terrain. Okay. So if I look at this carefully, right? It this is what's called a triangulated mesh. So I have a bunch of little tiny triangles that make up this particular piece of topography. But if I look in the valley, for example, right? The nature of my triangles means that I have all these little pieces that kind of stick up. In, in kind of an odd way. So it's really not the most attractive or nice piece of terrain. It's kind of chunky would probably be the best way of describing it. So we want to take this mesh and we want to convert it into a nice smooth NURB surface that we can work with, a nice smooth Rhino surface. Uh, and so we're going to do that using a command called contour. And I have a, um, a, a little tutorial that walks through this. And I'm sure I say what it is. Uh, right, we're at 5.23 and 5.24. We'll walk through. This is Rhino, 5.23 and 5.24. So the first one will walk you through bringing it in. Obviously, we can't do that. And the next one will walk you through um, the curved network. So it's kind of a combination of those two that'll get you there. Um, but I, I like to point this stuff out so that you can uh, you can actually follow along if if my steps go too fast or, or whatever. So it is written here, and that's what we're going we're gonna to end up doing. So I'm in kind of right here. I just did step five. I'm going to do step six next. OK, so here I am. And when I start to work on these files, I need to be organized. Um, and so let me get rid of the Google stuff that came in. Of course, Steve is still there. We're going to have to get rid of Steve later. Uh, that was the little person that came. Uh, and so let me go ahead, and I'm going to start working, and we'll work on layer one. And I'm going to call this contours x. And I'm also going to have a contours y, so I'll make that layer first, y. So we're going to start with contours x. So contours x is the active layer. I double-clicked on it. I have the little checkbox. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a command that basically takes a surface and runs a bunch of parallel lines across it. And that, that, that command is the contour command. And I can get to it by typing contour, or I can go to curve, curve from objects, contour, right there. And when I do that, it's going to say select objects for contours. That's step one. Well, the object is going to be this piece of terrain, this mesh. And so I'll go ahead and press Enter when I'm done. Then it's going to say contour base point. I want to pick one of the corners of this object. Now, I have vertex and not checked, which means I can snap to the, this particular corner. Uh, if you don't have it, you won't be able to, to snap to it. So you'll probably need to turn those on. Once I've done that, I establish that corner. It asks me for a direction perpendicular to the contour planes. And for whatever reason, this is a, a really hard thing for people to, to grasp exactly what it's asking for. Essentially what it's doing is it says that if I have some kind of a surface right, that ends in these points, and I'm initiating the contour command from right here. It wants me to, to tell it which vector going off in the direction is perpendicular to where I want to cut all of my contour lines. So I want this vector, and that's what it's asking for. So I'll say, because this is contours x, I want a vector going off in the x direction. So I can see my little guide here with my x, y, and z. I want to go off in the x direction. Now, I want this to be exactly on the x-axis. I don't want to be up at an angle. I don't want to snap to the other end point. So I'm going to turn on ortho so that I know it's perfectly flat. And I'm going to go way off here in space such that there's no snaps, there's no little targets, there's nothing. And I'll go ahead and pick in that direction. Then it's going to ask me distance between the contours. And I have to specify a value. We're going to pick a value that's somewhere in the feet range. It's probably going to be 50 feet to 100 feet. It depends on the size of the topography to begin with. And so I'm going to start with 50 feet, and we'll see how that turns out. And when I hit Enter, you'll watch Rhino cover my terrain in a series of parallel lines. And so you can see all of those parallel lines are perpendicular to the x-axis going off in that direction. I'm going to repeat this going in the y direction. And actually, I think I'll probably do it at 100, because this is probably a little bit too dense for what I need. So let me repeat it again. So curve, curve from objects, contour. I'm, I'm doing the same one over again. I'm just going to do it at 100 feet instead. Enter. I'm going to pick this as my vertex. Again, I'm going to go off in the x direction here. And I'll set my value this time to 100 feet. Yeah, it's a little better. Okay? Remember that I'm, I'm taking these from all of these little triangles. So I don't need it to be too tight together because the triangles are all relatively flat surfaces. I, I don't need too much more than that. OK, so next I want to change my layer from x to y. OK, now it's on y. And before I do the contour command, I need to deselect all of the lines. Okay, I have to make sure that they're not selected anymore. If you do a contour right now, and you do a contour from this point going in the y direction, you'll get a bunch of little points. Because a contour of a line gives us a point. A contour of a surface gives us a line. So we need to make sure nothing's selected. Then we'll go back, curve, curve from objects, contour. The object is again going to be the surface. There it is. Enter. We'll start at that little vertex. And this time, we're going off in the y direction. And the same thing, I'm off here, not snapped to anything, uh, just in the y direction. I'll do the same value, 100 feet, which is 1,200 inches. I'll go ahead and hit Enter. And I'll have a second set of contours that then define this object. So I've got x and I've got y. And I can now safely turn off the SketchUp file altogether. And when I turn off all of the SketchUp, the terrain and everything, I have basically uh, kind of this mesh that 
then defines what the surface looks like. It looks a lot like the surface because it came from the surface in the first place. So if I look at this in the top view, let me zoom out, I should have a perfect grid of squares. Right? If I see lines that are going off on a diagonal, then I didn't pick the true x-axis and the true y-axis. I was off. And I'd get uh, slanting lines or curving lines. So I want it to look like a perfect grid of squares. So you can probably guess where we're going. Right? We're going to be creating a curved network based on all of these curves to create a nice surface from them. Unfortunately, remember, curved networks don't like to play with ragged edges. We learned that last class. So I'm going to have to go through and I'm going to have to do a trim of all of these little ragged edges to make sure that they, they end nicely. So I'll use this object there, or that line, as a trim. I'll type trim. And I'll just drag a box through all of those objects like that. And I'll trim off everything. So it's pretty easy to do. All right, I'll finish it. We'll get rid of that line. And then we'll move to this one. And I'll do the same thing. Trim. And I'll drag from the right to the left through all of those objects. I'll get rid of them. And then I'll get rid of this piece. Same thing at the bottom. I just, in this context, I have to be kind of careful. It's going to be hard to select these perfectly. So it may take a couple passes to get all of them. There. And there. And again, I just have to make sure that I don't have any ragged edges. So I'm looking and they meet nicely. Likewise, up here, they all meet nicely. I still have to fix this one side. This side is the most difficult to do because you can't, it's hard to select from right to left when you're up against the line. So it takes a little bit more to do it. But I'll type trim. And then it may take a little bit of zooming to, to get in close enough to get all of these. You might have to get to a point where you click a few. Sorry, I switched views. My bad. There we go. All right, so I've got all of those done. Now that I have it nice and clean around the outside edge, I can use these curves to create a curved network of this surface. So before I do that, I want to double, double click on this layer 3, and I'm going to rename this layer to be um, you know, topo surface or something like that. I don't know. right? Something that distinguishes it. I'll make that the active layer. Okay, because I'm going to create it on that layer. And I will select all of these curves. And I'll go up to Surface Curve Network, or type Network Surface. And when I do that, it's going to say, wait a minute, we've got lots and lots of curves. Are you sure you want to do this? Okay, This is a good po point to say, well, maybe not. Maybe I should save this first. So I'm going to go to File, Save, and save it, because this can crash during this process. It usually doesn't. It used to always crash on computers. And it used to be that you'd do this and then go have coffee and come back, and it would eventually make it for you. It's gotten a lot better um, since the earlier days of Rhino. But let me go ahead and name this uh, Exercise 211 and save, just in case. And then we'll go up to Curve, or excuse me, Surface Curve Network. Yeah, go ahead and do it anyway. And it was able to recognize all four of the corners. If we're really struggling with the, the computer crashing, we can adjust these values, the edge curves, edge curves and the interior curves, to be not quite as precise. Uh, and that can save a little bit. I think the computer can probably handle it. Likewise, if we check the box for loose, that would make it a little easier on the computer. I'm going to let it do its thing. And so I'll go ahead and say, OK. This can take a couple minutes to do. So you just kind of have to be patient while it's doing its thing. The other thing to point out 
is it will look up here like nothing's happening, right? It'll just say command blank like this, and you'll get this little, you know, wheel. Just hang out. Give it some time. The Oh, no, I've never seen it. On, no, on these computers, I've never seen that. You can look it up. Just look at last year's assignment. It's there. I always think about changing the location, and then I end up just going with it. No, I'm not changing it. Weird, I'll have to look at it and see. OK, so it just finished, like I said, a couple minutes. And you will notice that when it does finish, your whole computer will get extraordinarily sluggish. It will get very, very slow. If you try to zoom in, which I just did, it's going to like, oh, there we go. Oh, let me zoom in. Uh, I can't quite do it. Wait, maybe. OK, I can. Okay, This is a problem, because it would be really annoying to model. Uh, in this kind of a, a scenario. So I'm going to turn off the X and the Y first, which again, patience, one click, wait, etc. Which once that's off, there we go, we see that I have this kind of dark blue object. Maybe. Okay. I'm going to click on the dark blue object, and it's going to turn bright yellow eventually. There we go. Okay? This is a sign that the density of this surface is so great and so detailed that we're, we're using too much computing power. So I'm going to type rebuild. It's also under the edit menu, I believe, rebuild, which will bring up the rebuild options for this surface. And again, this is a patience exercise. OK, and we get to a U point count and a V point count. And I'm going to set this to 100 by 100. That's usually a safe, uh, reasonable rebuild for what we're doing. I do want to make sure that it's deleting the input. I don't want to keep the input. And then I'll go ahead and say OK. Don't click on Preview, because it'll just tank your computer while you do it. OK, so now that I've done that and I've rebuilt it as 100 by 100, I can very easily get right back and I can start manipulating it as if it's a normal surface, right? It, it, before we do the rebuild, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of like 1,000 by 1,000 or something. So it's just too much data. So as we look carefully here, right, we can see some of the approximation or some of the smoothing of the original SketchUp file in contrast to the Rhino file. So I've turned them both on for a second. And this is not something that you'll necessarily do, but I want to be able to point out the differences. So as we look at this, right? let's look at this ridge here. The SketchUp file makes these triangles that represent the ridge. Right? Rhino has smoothed that out a bit so that we now have what looks more like a normal ridge. Okay? But it still has some humps, some ins and outs, which is less than desirable. Okay? So this rebuild was at 100 by 100. So I'm going to rename this layer for a second to be topo surface 100 by 100 so that you guys can see this as we progress. I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this layer, which gives me, and we'll rename this one to be 50 by 50. And so once again, if I move to 50 by 50, let me change object layer. I needed to change the object layer to 50 by 50. Oh, you know what? Let me make sure. I want to make sure that I have two copies of the object. No, I don't. So let me, I need to save this. So let me copy in place the object layer. Good. I have two versions. That's what I was after. So let me take the 50 by 50 there, and I'm going to rebuild this to 50 by 50. 
and I'll say OK. And it will then smooth out even more. Let me change the color of the 50 by 50 to be contrasting. And now we can turn on the 100 by 100 and the 50 by 50, and we can start to see the difference. So if we look at that same ridge, right, the 100 by 100 has these little pieces that stick up that are still based on that original triangle. Okay, so the triangle is very jagged. Then we move into the 100 by 100, which is uh, the blue one, which has a little bit of that. And then when we rebuild to the 50 by 50, it's much smoother. Do you guys see that transition? Okay, so it's still very close to the original topography, but we've smoothed it out a little bit. Uh, and this is, again, an approximation. So we have to find whatever the right balance would be. So let me go ahead and create a new layer, and we'll call this topo surface. 25 by 25 for comparison. And again, this is not something that you'll necessarily do. I just want to show you how this, this process works. So let me again copy in place. And we're going to change objects to the 25 by 25. There it is in kind of gray form. And I'm going to rebuild that one to be 25 by 25. And I'll say OK. And so once again, if we compare the 50 by 50, right, which on this edge, let's see if I can zoom in there, is starting to get relatively smooth right there. But if we compare it to the 25 by 25, now it's really starting to get smooth. right? The valley in here is almost perfectly smooth. We don't have any little ups and downs. So we've gotten to a reasonable approximation that's pretty smooth. If we took it further, Right, if I took this to and did a rebuild, say, to 10 by 10, right, it's simplifying even more. And you can see that I'm, I'm really starting to get it very rounded. So there's a happy media of, of how far you push this or how far you don't push it. I think for me, if I were picking, 50 by 50 is about the right one. But that's to my taste. I like it to be still fairly accurate, but reasonable smoothing. Okay? And you have to judge what's appropriate for what you're doing in your particular case. Okay? And it depends on the scale and what you're trying to model, uh, et cetera. So now I have this 50 by 50. That's the one that I'm going to pick to work from for here. Let's say that I wanted to get what the actual contours would be of this particular file that I could export to, say, AutoCAD or something like that. This is going in the direction of laser cutting, but we're not quite there. There's going to be more to it. Okay? I'm going to do another layer, and I'm going to call this layer uh, topo lines. And I'm going to repeat the contour command that I did before, which was under um, curve, curve from objects, contour. There we go. And this time, I'm going to contour my 50 by 50 surface. But instead of going in the x direction or the y direction, this time I'm going to go up in the z direction. So I actually have to switch my view so that I can go straight up. There I am in the front view going straight up. And I'm going to specify my distance as some foot value. So if I did one foot, it would probably be too tight together. Maybe I'll do you know 20 feet, and we'll see what happens. So I'll type 20 feet, and it will then build a typical set of topo lines, right? as if you were working on um, a particular survey document or whatever, that work their way up this particular ridge. And so if I were to zoom in, we can see that all of those topo lines are perfectly horizontal this time. So I've used the contour command in three different ways. Uh, this last way is giving me, essentially, an interval going up my uh, particular mountainside. Okay, which is typical to what we normally see as a, as, a, as a contour lines or topo lines on a map or something like that. So one last step. I'd like to make all of those flat. So I'm going to do one more layer here, and we're going to call this topo lines flat. And I'll make that active. I'm going to create a surface larger than my terrain, something like that. And I'm going to use every single one of those curves that are on the topo lines layer. I'm going to switch to the top view. And I'll type project, 
or go to surface curve or uh, curve curve from objects project I think project yep select curves it's going to be all the curves from this topo lines layer so let me select objects there we go enter select surfaces it'll be this flat surface that I created I'll hit enter remember I had to do that in the top view for the projection to work and be done in just a second perfect let me go to move just so that I can move this off to the side and you can now see that I have a perfectly flat view that includes all the the as if I were doing an AutoCAD drawing or something so I'll take that last little piece and I'll go to file export selected and we're gonna export it as an AutoCAD DWG file okay so I'm just showing you the full process this is premature we're gonna do this more we're gonna control it more but I'm just kind of showing you how this stuff is related together okay so we'll go ahead and save this this is exercise 211 it's going to be an AutoCAD DWG, and I'll go ahead and click Save. We'll just do a default, like 2004 polylines, and I'll say OK. Perfect. So now I have an AutoCAD file, right, which I can turn off. That's the flat one. I have the topo lines, which I can also turn off. I have my surface at 50 by 50. And now, for the rest of the day, I'll spend time creating some kind of a meditation space that sits on this piece of topography somehow. Right? So you have a little design freedom to do something entertaining. Now, I never do things in a vacuum, so guess what? A meditation space could very easily be your table and chair, couldn't it? Hint, hint. Right? So you have time to work on that as well. Um, so if you feel a little bit behind and you want to spend some more time on your table and chair, work on that and just find a way to put it into this scene and do a rendering and, and turn that in for today. Make sense? Okay. So I know that there's a lot of, of steps to kind of go through. They are all written up. If you follow that 5.23 uh, and 5.24, it'll take you through everything with links to all the individual little tutorials for how it goes together. Um, this is kind of the precursor step to getting into this kind of a sophisticated level. The next two days, next week, we'll talk all about how do you actually build this. Uh, and you'll learn a lot more about things like seaplanes and whatever uh, as part of that exercise. Any questions? No? So for today, you'll post your images, your rendered image of your meditation spot, whatever that would be. And you'll also upload your DWG file just so I have a record that you were able to create it in the first place. I don't really care if it turns out right. I just want you to have to have tried. Okay? So one post, those two things in it.